I was thinking that man. I can kind of see him. Good. But the bear. I can't, I can't think of anyone else. Yeah. Have you been in? I've not been in a theater, but in Calgary, and then oh. in both Vancouver. Oh, I kept thinking this was the same. No. Well, the new Godzilla movie was amazing. So hearing yeah, yeah, on the big screen, yeah. yeah. especially with the, the round sound they did and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the past few weeks. The past few weeks. So if people are watching now, yeah, they're good. Pretty sure they have to be good. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, how much? Do you well, I think it's like seven hundred seats that are still open. Oh, I, I got, I got trick questions. <laughs> yeah, those are those are deep plays. I totally get my trick questions. I'll just play politics and say whatever. Frank, did you write stuff down? If you don't want me to do did it, you write stuff down. down. What's that? Did you type that things up? I no. did. Frank, did. okay. Frank did. <laughs> the questions are your answer. Yeah. All right, I think we're gonna get ready to go here. Well, welcome. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our first hybrid event of 2021 uh, with the Indian Valley Chamber of Commerce. My name is Steve Huntsberger, and I'll be your moderator for the day. And we are live and online. Uh, we're broadcasting today from the beautiful Sellersville Theater. And a special thanks uh, to Elaine Brick, owner, and Fe uh, Dan Fea, the uh, technical manager here at the theater. So thanks for making this a possibility. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, our presenting sponsor, Almac. Uh, as many of you know, Almac uh, was a participant in the uh, Operation Warp Speed bringing the vaccine through trials and ultimately to market. Uh, we feel very proud uh, to have uh, these folks in our Chamber of Commerce, on our community, and uh, they have done so much uh, for, for the, the health care of, of the country and the world. And uh, this is just one way of saying uh, thank you for, and we want to honor them today. So let's, let's give them a round of applause, thanks. So we're going to hear from Mark Rolfing uh, a little bit later. He's their Vice President of Operations. Uh, we're looking forward to that. So we have a great program lined up today. Uh, we're going to be hearing from our guests about this idea of resilience. Uh, I'll provide you all with a quick uh, introduction of the panelists. And there is a biography in the, in the program uh, if you'd like to take a look at that a little bit further. But we have, uh, as I said, Mark Rolfing, the Vice President of Operations with Almac Group, and of course their, headquarter, their North American headquarters are in Souderton, Pennsylvania. Uh, we have Kyle Hoff. Uh, Kyle is the President of Hoff Properties uh, located in Souderton. We have Tracy Pachaki. Tracy is the President of Illustrated Designs located in Hatfield. Uh, we have Ed Brubaker. Uh, Ed is the President and CEO of Living Branches located in, in Lansdale and Souderton. We have Dr. Frank Gallagher. He is the superintendent of schools for the Southern Area School District. And we have Susie Berry, owner of Travel House, also located in Souderton. So can we give our panelists a round of applause before we get started? And, and I will say, it is, it is fantastic to have a live audience here. It has been 13 months since we've had a live event, and it is great to see so many, uh, so many faces and, and, and friends and, and colleagues. So I have been thinking a lot about this idea of resilience over the last year. 
It's defined as the ability of a strain, and particularly in physics, the ability of a strained body to recover its size and shape after a stress, like a blow or a strike. A more colloquial definition uh, could be the ability to recover or adjust from a misfortune or change. Uh, and, and one more different definition is that of business resilience, which is the ability of an organization to adapt in a changing environment to enable it to deliver its objectives and to survive and prosper. Let me read that one again. Business resilience is the ability of an organization to adapt in a changing environment to enable it to deliver its objectives and to survive and prosper. 2020 and 2021 have certainly been a time of swiftly changing circumstances that have challenged even the strongest individuals and organizations. We, were, we have been presented with opportunities and everyone needed to pivot, there's that word you've heard a lot this year, to deal with ch the challenges that were presented to us. And in no way do I want to minimize the negative effects of COVID. The disruption, the pain, the death, and emotional distress caused by the effects and government shutdowns of COVID-19 have been devastating and unlike most anything any of us have ever experienced. This has been a worldwide phenomenon. Everyone on the planet has been dealing with the same thing at the same time. I will acknowledge different communities have had different experiences depending on how it was addressed or wasn't addressed. But we're here today to learn from our peers how they have dealt with this experience, lessons they have learned, and to hear about how they have approached the last 13 months. My hunch is that we are all cautiously optimistic about the future. It seems that we are possibly through the really dark days of this pandemic and we are looking for encouragement. Encouragement to move on to the next stage. We need that little bit of a push to get us through. Today's discussion is designed to do just that. I find it's important to learn from our peers to move forward. My hope is to honor each one of our panelists and their experiences and thoughts that they have to share. But I also hope that everyone here in attendance and online will leave refreshed, encouraged, and energized to keep moving forward. So with that being said, let's move right into our panel discussion. And I'm sitting back here, so it's a little awkward, so my apologies, but I want to introduce Mark Rolfing. Uh, Mark is the VP of Operations at AllMac. We're pleased to have him with us today. And I'm going to jump right into these questions uh, because I think that's, that's why we're here. We want to learn from each other. So, Mark, AllMac is a, and you might want to talk about this a little bit more. Let me, can, I stand up? can I stand up and talk? That way you don't have to awkwardly look back at me. So AllMac is a contract development and manufacturing organization that provides services across the life cycle of product development for the pharmaceutical and biotech sector. It was instrumental in providing services to the development of vaccines currently in use to combat COVID-19. The federal government instituted Operation Warp Speed last year, and in a matter of mere months, industry mapped the virus, developed a vaccine, completed safety trials, and is successfully bringing the product to market. That is no small task. AllMac had previous work in the pipeline. Can you talk about how your team at AllMac was able to meet prior commitments while at the same time assist in this Herculean task of bringing this new vaccine to market? Sure, Steve, and, and thanks for uh, asking AllMac to be a part of the, the panel discussion today. I think it's a good uh, opportunity to get together and it's very therapeutic to talk through everybody's shared problems, I find. Uh, but first, first of all, it was really an honor for AlMac to be a part of really trying to find a solution um, or a cure for, for COVID-19. Uh, we were presented with about 125 opportunities since uh, March of last year to help support clinical trials, um, both therapeutic and for vaccines. Uh, and of course, uh, Steve mentioned the, the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine, which AlMac was the uh, was the, basically the main partner with Pfizer to package those supplies for the clinical trials and get those out to over 130 clinical sites throughout the world. And there were about 30,000 people part of that initial uh, study. So a great honor for us, uh, a lot of lessons learned that came out of that as well. But really, I think the number one reason uh, that we were able to, to 
to support those studies and continue with other diseases, because let's face it, cancer didn't go anywhere, heart, di heart disease didn't go anywhere, diabetes didn't go anywhere, and those studies uh, that were ongoing before the pandemic started needed to continue to, to move along there. And really our number one resource is our people. Um, you can have the greatest facilities in the world, you can have great computer systems and equipment, uh, but unless you've got great people that are dedicated to, to use those tools uh, to, to be successful, then you're really not going to get anywhere. I think ALMAC also is very fortunate to have a lot of uh, support across uh, the globe. We have facilities, multiple facilities, not only here in the U.S., but also uh, in Europe and in Asia. And we leverage that that shared capacity, that shared experience, that shared expertise, um, the best that we could. So a good example is the, the Satterton in our North uh, Northern Ireland facility. We're primarily doing the packaging and distribution for the Pfizer study. Uh, but our Durham, North Carolina facility, which is a, a smaller operation, um, did a lot of the project leadership and pharmacy support for that study. Um, so a lot of the, the, I guess, the intellectual capital was leveraged down at that facility, and, and it was much appreciated. Um, and also, there was a lull in clinical studies last year because, as you can imagine, people weren't going to clinical sites, uh, and a lot of these sponsors were concerned about getting supplies uh, across the globe because there weren't as many plane flights, and, and, uh, and there were other logistical concerns with PPE being shipped and whatnot. So... Uh, there was a lull there in the springtime and early summer that we recognized and we said, well, let's take advantage of this, quote, slow time so we could focus on the COVID studies and prepare ourselves for the, the surge in work uh, that we saw later in the year and, and, um, and are seeing this year as well. This year is, is almost as busy, if not more so, than last year. Thank you. So, Mark, I would like you to tell us a little bit more about AllMac. While you have been here for a while, my sense is that people don't know the organization as well as they should. AllMac is built on the legacy of Sir Alan McClay, uh, who, from what I have read, was an amazing man and one of Northern Ireland's most notable entrepreneurs and philanthropists. Can you tell us a little bit more about Sir Alan and your company's history? Sure. And, and if you're interested in, in Sir Alan, um, if you go on YouTube or go onto the AllMac website, you, there's a whole good clip uh, about Alan's life and, and the creation of Almac and, and where we are today. But uh, Sir Alan was, was born uh, during the, uh, the Great Depression uh, in Northern Ireland, in Cookstown, which is just uh, not far from Lake Nault in, um, in the north. Um, and he, he never went to college, but he went to, you know, he had technical training and he became a, a, a medical rep for Glaxo. Uh, but very much an entrepreneur and by his mid 30s uh, founded. Uh, his pharmaceutical company called Galen, uh, which is a reference to a, a, a Roman, probably the Roman, uh, best Roman recognized for medical development. And um, by the late 90s, his company Galen had uh, reached over a billion dollars in, in worth after it was floated uh, on the stock market. Um, but when the company bought a company called Warner, Warner Chilcott uh, around 2000, about, yeah, in the late 90s, um, he was concerned about the company's refocus on uh, more on drug development as opposed to all of these drug services businesses uh, that the company had built. Uh, and a lot of those service companies, they, they meant most of the workforce, particularly in Northern Ireland. And Alan was very concerned that these businesses were just going to be sold off. Uh, so the story is, and the story is true, that you know he retired from the board but just before his 70th birthday on a Friday and Monday uh, went and rented a, a local office there and began using his own personal money, his personal wealth that he had, had gained over the years to start to buy back these, these pharmaceutical service companies that were, were under the Galen umbrella. Uh, and that was back in 2001 when, when he, he, he bought all those companies. Uh, so it's been 20 years now, and that company is, is Almac, all right? So Alan McClay, Almac. Uh, and I always find that, that the fact that the company is named after him is, is so against, I guess, what Alan was all about because he was a very, uh, very humble guy. Alan Armstrong, who's our CEO, worked with Alan for years 
uh, was his right-hand man f until his death in, in 2010, um, is, is, we'll say that. He says, Alan was, was humble. He was a very humble man, um, but very, um, very outgoing uh, and, and, and a hard driver f for sure. Uh, and I think everybody in Almac will have a similar Al Alan story. If they knew uh, Alan had spent some time with him, I, I was fortunate enough to spend a weekend with him and Lady Heather uh, at, at the company house there in, in Bali Hanan. Um, and it was almost like I was a long lost nephew that he hadn't seen in two years. Um, and I probably had never spoken a word to, to Alan before that. But by the end of that weekend, he, he knew me well and would always pull me aside uh, every time they saw me to, to catch up on things. And I, and I think a lot of people have similar stories about Alan McClay. Um, so I, I, th I think in terms of resilience, um, Alan's focus on Almac as a family business. He, 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 he never had any kids. Uh, he didn't marry until the end of his life there when he, when he met, married Heather. Um, and he treated his staff, his employees, as his family. And he always called it the Almac family. Uh, and if you think about your own family and the things that you will do um, in order to ensure their future success uh, and their security, that really was what Alan was all about and, and, and enabled him to be as resilient, I think, an entrepreneur and a businessman because he knew he had his family behind his back. Is Almac publicly traded? No. So Almac, uh, before Alan died, he set up the, the uh, McClay Foundation. Uh, and under the foundation, Almac, the company, uh, is held in a trust. Um, so I've heard similar uh, comparisons to the Hershey Corporation, for example, there, that uh, it's not publicly held. Uh, it's technically a private company, but there's not a, a family that runs the business and gets all the profits. So under that trust, um, it's very, very difficult uh, in order for the company to be sold, which is a good thing, and that gives our employees a lot of security security, that, that they're going to show up the next day and, and Almec's going to be there and, and, and successful. Uh, and also, all of the profits that Almac makes are reinvested into the business. They, they don't go to any shareholders. They don't go to a, a you know, company that own, or people that own the business. Uh, and that allows us to continue to drive forward and, and build the business. That was an unscripted question, so thank you for yeah. allowing me to ask that. Uh, I think that also kind of really gets at the, the personality of, of Sir Allen and the quality of, a, of, the, of the business that Almac is. Uh, one final question for you, Mark. Uh, this gets kind of back to the, to the, the process that we've, we've gone through. How did you and your team implement protocols that allowed Almac to continue to operate at its high level, create an environment that allowed for continued and sophisticated corporate culture and ensure everyone was able to participate at 100% while still caring for your employees? Yeah, it's a good question. And we were all kind of talking about that, you know, before we got started. Everybody had a, a similar approaches and, and some different approaches, uh, I think. Um, I think I'm kind of covering the planning portion of, of the uh, panel discussion here today. And, and fortunately, you know, a larger company like Almac, we, we did have certain protocols in place uh, that we look to when uh, the waters get rough, so to speak. Um, and so these business, we call them business continuity plans, and, and a lot of organizations have these, these type of things. But um, they're not so much about uh, trying to figure out every last thing that might happen in the world that you, you know, you're going to have to be worried about. Uh, but, but creating a firm structure, a command control structure there. So when th bad things do happen, you recognize those quickly and you get the right people together to make decisions. And then those decisions, you know, move their way down the organization. And, and Almac certainly has that structure in place. And we leverage that uh, for COVID and we leverage that for Brexit, which is another sore topic for, for our company being, you know, in the north of Ireland. Uh, but uh, but we put those you know those measures uh, forward with with good success. Uh, flexibility is it was very very important. Um, somebody was was talking about using muscles that we you never knew that you had there, um, and I think flexibility, knowing that the last year was was not you're not going to be able to do things the same way that you might have done that in the past, and if you try to hold on to your your normal business practices. Uh, that you're just going to make it tougher for yourself. 
Um, so flexibility in, in people's working approach is probably, you know, the number one thing that people talk about. About half of the people at ALMAC uh, work at the facility, either on the factory floor, in the warehouse, or in the laboratories. Uh, it's not something that you can do at home. So those folks needed to know that they were coming to a place that was safe as possible for them. Uh, and we certainly put uh, all the measures that we could, as provided by the state and the county and the CDC, uh, in place. You know, the social distancing, um, the staggered shifts, the, the, um, uh, the reporting structure of positive cases, if they were to happen, what you were to do in those situations. Uh, so flexibility, very important. But on the other hand, we have a half our staff that had to work from home um, because the state asked for that to happen and we had that flexibility. Uh, so fortunately, we had planned ahead and we had bought laptops for most of those people uh, that could work from home before the pandemic hit. Uh, and then we also instituted, uh, you know, the MS Teams is what we use, but basically the, the virtual conferencing technology was already in the works and all we had to do was push the, the big red button uh, and get it started. And I'll tell you, that's been a godsend without, without that kind of conferencing technology, it would have been almost impossible for us to, to do what we did over the last year. Uh, and then I think communication is, is, is very important. Um, and, and we tried to be as upfront with our employees as, as possible um, and, and tell them the truth, the things that we were going to be doing and why, and the things that we were not gonna be able to do and, and why not. And a good example of that is, um, you know, normally Almac, like a lot of companies, you know, they have a company picnic every year. Um, and Almac has really, you know, three large company picnics every year with family and, and employees that, that go to those. We knew we weren't gonna, gonna have those last year. So the funds that were budgeted for that, um, we decided to give to charity. Uh, and some employees wanted to know if, if, if those funds could be redistributed to the staff as opposed to, to charities be, to help them out. Uh, and it's, it was a good question. Um, and they were looking out for the security of themselves and the family. But, but when we did the math, you know, it would come out to $25 after taxes, you know, and that's not something really that's going to make a difference in the, the, the lives of our employees. But concentrating that $300,000 across about 30 charities, uh, dealing with COVID, dealing with race and inequality, we felt that that was going to get the most value for, for the funds there. That being said, we, we did set up uh, bonuses that we gave to, to staff throughout the year because of their hard work, and we did institute a, a performance bonus that will be given every year tied to the company's performance there. So uh, again, we, we, we tried to communicate the things that uh, we, we felt were most important to the employees, not hold anything back, because in the absence of information, people tend to make up their own stories, uh, and, and we want to make sure that, that, that people you know, get the skinny, so to speak. Thanks, Mark. That, I think that gives us a better insight into Almac. So I appreciate you sharing that, uh, and we appreciate you being here today. So thank you. Thank you very much. I want to move on to Kyle Hoff. Uh, so Kyle is the owner of Hoff Properties and the, uh, the, the Broad Theater. Um, and, and I have given each one of these uh, panelists kind of a word to focus their thoughts around. So um, Kyle's is grit. So grit, Kyle, grit is a concept that combines personal passion and perseverance over the long term. It's really a long term thing. Gritty people put in sustained effort over the long term to succeed. Uh, it's kind of the epitome of the successful American. Passion, hard work, patience, and practice, practice, practice. We're kind of excited when we see these overnight uh, success stories, but that's not really where real success comes from. Uh, you have had great success in renovating buildings, saving history, and revitalizing places in, in towns like Souderts and Telford, and I think Phoenixville also. So grit is built on optimism. So my question is, what were you thinking opening a theater in the middle of a pandemic? Well, yeah, that is, we've gotten that question a lot. Um, thank you for having me here for this. Um, so, uh, yeah, the theater and grit are uh, almost very, very synonymous with each other. Um, we, my business partner, Charlie Crown, and I, when COVID hit, we were like, 
we kind of stepped back a little bit. And we're like, okay, um, what what do we do? And we uh, we decided, you know, we're we were halfway through framing it, so we followed all the guidelines, submitted for work waivers, and then just put our nose to the grindstone and just dealt with it on a day to day basis and saw it through to completion and. Now we're running it and operating it, and it's going well. And I will say, if you haven't been to the Broad Theater, it's an absolutely beautiful facility. Make sure you go and visit it sometime. And it's safe, like here, it's safely done, so it's, it's fantastic. You have a few slides, too, also. Yes. Do you want, do you want us to pull those up? Is there oh, anything yeah. you want to go through those uh, with us? Well, yeah, it was just stuff. Um, so uh, in terms of grit and uh, with what I do with development work... Um, I, I just try to be present on the job site um, and relatable. And then also in dealing with municipalities and all the approval process that goes with land development. Um, yeah, I think it's just staying steady on, on the uh, project and the timeline of it and uh, putting just – the ability to focus on small details, but then also being able to look at big picture stuff. Um, you're, you're, you're focused on being part of the process. Yes, very, very focused. Yes, these are just pic old pictures of projects that I've done that I've been very proud of and been a part of. That is now the, the Broad Street grind. That was the old Freed Hall. That could have easily been torn down. You saved that. And it almost did fall down. Yeah. <laughs> almost every project has almost. The, sm the smoke factory. Yes. Beautiful project also. Thank you. The, Beautiful um, project. Yeah. And then, so I, I developed the buildings and then I am the landlord for them. Um, so during COVID was especially very nervous because um, when it all hit and your businesses were shutting down. I mean, I have 15 commercial tenants, and it was like, what's going to happen? Um, so I, I was able to be kind and compassionate and work with the individual tenants, um, you know, and help them with rent and deferring rent and uh, modifying leases. Like, hey, maybe we'll have lower monthly rent, but just extend the, the lease term. Mm -hmm. um, and several of my tenants really... They were innovative and really like kind of took a step back and thought, okay, we are not allowed to have people do certain things. How can we create revenue and other sources? Um, the Broad Street Grind, for example, they weren't allowed to have people come in to eat in their restaurant. So they started offering delivery, which is a way to, you know, create more revenue. Um, the Harleysville Party Rental, they... Uh, I mean, when the COVID happened in March and April, literally all the parties were canceled. So then they started, okay, well, churches started renting tents from them. Restaurants started renting tents from them. So they kind of had to change their mindset and be flexible, like you guys were talking about earlier. Um, I think that's been the key to a lot of it. And yeah. Using new muscles. Yes. I, I, like, that. I like that terminology. That's the 2020 definition. That is the 2020. Kyle, you've dealt with a variety of difficult things over the years, from zoning to structural issues. We saw some of those structural issues to tenants. How did these experiences prepare you to steel yourself to continue moving forward with your projects? I mean, you talked about it a little bit, but I think I want to hear a little bit more about. So, like, in, in the midst of that economic uncertainty, what was that, what was that like? I mean, what were those conversations like? Ah, it was, uh, there was a lot of fear. Um, but then just a lot of being able to, uh, really be there for the tenants, um, and just know that this is a temporary setback. Um, and I think just being kind and compassionate was a big part of it. Um, and putting myself in seeing things from their perspective instead of just being like, this is what the lease says. You gotta do it. Um, yeah. And then, um. Yeah, I think a lot of my, per like what I went through being paralyzed and just dealing with that on a day-to-day -day basis has helped with 
being able to do real estate development um, and the surprises that come with that and the nuances and the sometimes it's a pain, but I enjoy it. So Every day is a little bit different, isn't it? Very different. Yes. You don't get bored. No, no, no bored. <laughs> do you have any other projects in the pipeline that you can tell us about? Well, I have one in, um, we're in Sourton Borough, the, uh, at 113 in School Lane, that former, the parking lot there by the high school. Yes. Yeah, that's getting turned into two commercial uh, spaces, about 4,000 to 4,500 square feet total. So. When is it? What's the timeline? I'm just curious. What's the timeline for that? We'll do a ribbon cutting for you. Yeah, well, it's, well, we'll see. We, construction material costs are a little high right now. So. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. I appreciate you sharing with us. I want to move on to Tracy Pachaki. Uh, Tracy is the uh, owner of Illustrated Designs. And when we were, Tracy sits on my marketing committee. So when we were talking about what does this event for resilience look like, uh, she was also talking about, well, there, you know, mindset is a really important piece of this. And she said, I just so happen to have a little bit, I've been thinking about this, she said, and we have a little bit of a presentation uh, uh, to go. So. Um, we have some slides to pull up for that. Um, and, and Tracy, you're, you're the second generation uh, small business owner of Illustrated Designs. And over the last year, like a lot of other small business owners, you faced a lot of challenges uh, mentally and it's taken a toll on all of us. So how do you see mindset improving our work and personal lives? Uh, well, we are all in our heads a lot. And sometimes I think that it can feel like a roller coaster between confidence and self-doubt. And in 2020, I think that that roller coaster was a lot steeper and windier and probably had a couple loops in it um, that we all weren't expecting. But even pre-pandemic, I personally suffered with things like imposter syndrome, uh, perfectionism, and a lot of negative self-talk. In the last 13 months, I've had an opportunity to talk with a lot of people, including small business owners at all different levels of success, who've opened up and expressed that they go through a lot of the same self-inflicted problems. Um, in a way, I kind of felt good knowing that what's going on up here, I wasn't alone, um, but it, it put me on a path to learn a little bit more about mindset. Uh, I've as a marketing strategist, I've always been uh, interested in things like neuroscience and things that bring our minds into a familiar state so that um, we can understand how to market to people. But um, I think that it's, it's nice to know when a problem happens that we're not all unique. You know, there are some things that, that bring us all together. So in my research, I came across a book from Dr. Carol Dweck, and if we can look at the slides, um, she in her book describes two different mindsets, a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. In the fixed mindset, this is where we're avoiding challenges and we give up easy. Um, we see effort as not being worth it and we ignore criticisms and feedback, and we also feel threatened by others' success. I believe this is where scarcity and lack live in the fixed mindset. Now, neuroscience actually teaches us that as human beings, we are all comfortable with the familiar. So even if a fixed mindset doesn't help us, because we're comfortable, we stay here. Now on the opposite end is growth mindset. This is where we embrace challenges. We persist in the face of setbacks. We see effort as the path to greater things and we learn from our criticisms. Now this takes us out of our comfort zone and growing pains are real. So going into a growth mindset can get uncomfortable, but this is where we go and gain greater success and gain resilience. So to improve our personal and our work lives, we need to get out of our comfort zones and work on having a growth mindset. So do you have some mindset exercises that you have utilized over the last couple months? Yeah, I've, I've been trying to use some growth mindset exercises on and off for years, but in the last year, I've spent a lot more time working on them. 
Um, there are so many resources out there. We don't have a lot of time to go over quite a few today. So if you, you know, are interested, I can recommend a, a ton of books and um, websites and authors and all kinds of resources for you. But the first exercise I want to talk about is rewarding yourself, especially as small business owners. I think when we have a win, we're just so busy that we move right on to the next project. And even if we recognize a win, a lot of times we'll just chalk it up to some external factor or even luck. But the reality is when your efforts pay off, you should really reward yourself, even if it's a tiny reward, because what that does is it helps you to gain confidence and build momentum as you move forward. The second exercise is identifying and focusing on your strengths. I think we've all heard the concept of fake it till you make it. And this is probably the worst thing you can do. It actually feeds imposter syndrome even more so because you're not com comfortable there. But if you know what your strengths are and just focus on those, it can help you. A lot of us, however, don't have the ability of looking inward and focusing and figure out what our strengths are. So if you have some close associates or family members or friends that you can trust that have your best interest in heart, you can just ask them to describe you. And when they describe you, chances are they're going to describe you as more talented than you think of yourself. They're going to describe you as more of an industry expert than you think you are. And they're probably going to say that you're more confident than you feel. So I think that having those, ability, those conversations with people that you trust can help you to figure out your strengths. The third exercise is daily affirmations. And sometimes it can sound like a little bit woo-woo out there, but it's worked wonders for millions of people, including myself. All you have to do is take all of those negative self thoughts and write them down and find the flip side of it. Find what the positive affirmation is on that negative self-talk. Rip up the list of negative self-talk and then read the positive affirmations to yourself daily, sometimes more than once a day. I know people who also record them and listen to them so they don't have to repeat them out loud. But what that does is it actually reprograms over time, the repetition reprograms that negative self-talk. And then the fourth and last one I want to talk about is embracing failure and learn from every opportunity. Uh, what's interesting is a lot of us are perfectionists and perfectionism is this unattainable false thing that we're reaching for. And since it doesn't exist, what it actually winds up doing is uh, for, it forces us to not even take one step forward because we're always afraid of making a mistake. But we learn more from our mistakes than we do our successes. So I always say that life teaches you lessons until you learn them. So you might as well just learn them as fast as you can. I, I think that it, it, when, we, when we fail, we learn our lessons. I, I like that. Do you have any examples of how the, these, these mindset, uh, this mindset has helped you and your clients uh, through, res through this idea of resilience over the last year or so? Yeah, absolutely. So I have felt and seen a positive growth uh, mindset really help people to lower their stress, uh, have increased productivity, overall happiness in, pers in their personal and professional lives. Um, having a positive growth mindset is something that I work with with our clients before we start any marketing for them because obviously if you're not thinking positively about yourself or your business, you're not going to be putting your best foot forward. So we work with a lot of small businesses on that before we even get started on anything else. But personally, I had a huge aha moment very recently. I had a goal for myself that I had been working on for a really long period of time. I had a lot, put a lot of effort into it. And I found out that I failed. And honestly, before working on all of the mindset exercises, that failure would have had me start second guessing every step that I had made. I would have started to doubt my abilities. I would have replayed the events over and over again in my head. Ultimately, that failure would have just stopped me in my tracks for any length of time. Um, but because I have been working on some mindset exercises, I decided to put them into play. And I took a few minutes, I stepped back, took some deep breaths, 
And I looked at the failure. I looked at the opportunities that were presented. I looked at the mistakes that I had made. And I created new opportunities. And interestingly enough, that entire process just took me minutes instead of days or weeks or, or longer. So those, those few minutes of taking that time to really self-reflect honestly made more opportunities within weeks that had already exceeded my original goals. So I was blown away by that. I was like, okay, there's something to this. But I recognized right then and there that a growth mindset really allows mistakes and hardships to form us into more resilient versions of ourselves, but only if we let it. You, you, you did learn that lesson quickly, didn't you? You made one comment that I really, I wanna, I, I really, I resonate with it. Uh, you, you talked about this idea of getting out of our comfort zones. I have a very good, I remember the day, I remember where I was, a good friend of mine, Doug Clemens, who said to me, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And I hate that, but I think about it every day. And you, you articulated that so well. So I think that, I, I think, hey, we've, we've, we've been in an uncomfortable situation the last 13 months, I think, every single one of us. So that was, that was an important piece that I, I resonate with. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tracy. Ed, let's move on to you. Ed is, as a reminder, Edward Brubaker is the president and CEO of Living Branches. So as the CEO of a uh, con continuing care retirement community, uh, you've had some challenging decisions to make this last year. Uh, seniors are some of the most vulnerable population that we have, particularly as we deal with COVID. Um, and you had, not only did you have older, compromised folks living in a congregate setting, but you have younger people coming in out of the community to care for them, your employees. Um, so y you and your team had some challenging situations every single day. So Living Branches navigated that very well. Uh, how did compassion frame your decisions when keeping your residents safe potentially meant preventing them from seeing their loved ones for an extended period of time. Now, that, that sounds like a little bit of a loaded question. My dad lives at Souderton Home. That, did, that is not a loaded question. Um, I, I wanted to recognize that that didn't come necessarily out the way I wanted it to, but I think <laughs> compassion is a really important piece, and, and you, you exude, you exude compassion. I wanna say, and I want to say clearly, uh, I think Living Branches exudes compassion. Well, thank you, Steve, and thanks for... Uh, uh, having us here today. It's been great listening to the other persons. I feel like I've learned a lot more about our community and and opportunities and businesses in our community. So this has been wonderful. Um, and I don't know if we need to look at your father's occupancy agreement or anything, but uh, we'll, we'll talk later. That's only fair after that. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, compassion is one of our core values is, is probably no big surprise for a retirement or life plan community. And uh, we describe it as enhancing lives by serving others with kindness, patience, humility, and forgiveness. And as I reflect on compassion over the past year, I, I would say that has been just such a core of what we needed to do. But I would also have to admit that depending on whose perspective you're coming from, we may or may not have appeared to be compassionate because I've had numerous phone calls or letters or uh, conversations with people, some of whom who were happy with the decisions we were making, uh, some of whom were uh, very upset with the decisions we were making. But I think the common ground was trying to do the best for those we serve and for our residents. And I would have to say that I think uh, parts of our business are very regulated. In fact, uh, somebody once said that we are more regulated in nursing homes than uh, the nuclear power industry. I often wondered like, who actually sat down and counted the regulations and looked at them. So I don't know if it's true or not, but the point is we're very regulated. And so we need to pay attention to what CMS says, to what the State Department of Health says, County Department of Health, so many different places. And so that impacted what we could and couldn't do, but we had to be creative within those regulations. But I do think that there were pieces in our industry that we have learned that we did overall, we, we had some significant challenges on at least one of our campuses and, and overall too. 
but we've learned that we focused significant resources on protecting the physical body and the emotional needs of residents. And I would say staff too, but focusing on residents was not always where it, it could or should have been. And I think the regulators are realizing that too, even as things are changing more recently with the opportunities for visits and those kinds of things. But even within that, we, we tried to be creative. So um, we, we very early on bought a lot of uh, tablets so that people could do uh, Skyping with their families and that kind of thing. Um, because that connection and the seeing of people, now it got confusing depending on uh, the person's status as to, you know, is this my daughter uh, in California, but she's on this thin uh, tablet thing. But that was something we did and, and, and worked very hard at. We also have music therapists that in a normal time is just a wonderful, wonderful thing to watch uh, them interact. It's just beautiful. Well, singing is one of those things that you couldn't do. And so I remember in meetings, we, we set up a coronavirus response team very early on. And uh, in fact, we were meeting when Governor Wolf shut down the state for what we thought was two weeks. Um, that group had infection control, our infection control coordinator, and also marketing and a number of other people. But the dynamics of different perspectives was just so helpful because, of course, you, you would recognize the infection control person wanted to keep people safe and, and, and was very oriented that way. And marketing person would be like, why would in the world would anyone want to move in to this place if you can't see your relatives and, and visit? And so that interplay was very helpful to have those different perspectives and be back and forth and say, what can we do? And how can we put our, ourselves in the position of those we serve? And how can we be creative? So with music therapy, they had face shields and masks, but we mic'd them up uh, that they could sing um, and interact too. And it took a while to figure out some of those things. But we always were thinking about what is our residence experience and how can we work at that? And how can we be compassionate in what we do? I think someone else earlier talked about it's you know easy to be hard on ourselves. And I, I tend to be a person... You know, well, we accomplished that. Okay, what's next? Let's move on. And, and taking time to celebrate and say this was really good. And, and so hearing other people's stories, um, there are facilities out there, not, not the, in the local not-for-profit community, but out there that didn't even know what a compassionate caregiver was. And the family had to push them through their corporate office to say, we want to be able to visit our resident. And that was just recently our family member. And so for us, it was about putting ourselves in the shoes of those we serve and trying to be as creative as possible. Thank you. So these ideas of resilience and compassion are really complementary to each other. Compassion and empathy create a sense of connectedness among people. Can you discuss how you see this happening at Living Branches, perhaps even between residents and staff? And how do you think this can spill over possibly into the wider community? Yeah, you, you talked about the definition of, of resilience, and I also had looked up the definition of compassion, and it was sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with a desire, and I say also action, uh, to alleviate it. And so that opportunity to see distress and help it relieve it, resilience is the ability to adjust to stress. And so I see it as kind of this interconnected circle. Compassionate com uh, people, compassionate organizations create resilient people, creating compassionate people, creating resilient people. And so it's, it's kind of this circular thing. And so you can look at that from an organization, a personal standpoint, society. Uh, are we a compassionate society, et cetera? And so we observe, we assist, we receive, we learn, and we pass it on uh, to others. But a, a story that this didn't happen in the pandemic, but it's a story I've told many times. Uh, we, I call it the hoagie story. And this was a situation, we have a, a program where we in leadership uh, will rotate weekends, and I happen to be there on a weekend. And uh, a CNA, uh, we call them resident assistants, because they assist the residents, not the nurses, but they 
Uh, the CNA was coming up and she was saying, this resident in healthcare, they wanted a hoagie. They were hungry for a hoagie. Well, for the, the rest of us out here, we need a hoagie, we go to Wawa, right? We get in our car and do that. But, and, and there's people in residential or independent living that can do that as easily as anyone in this room that live with us. But in healthcare, it's different. They're there because of um, mental health needs or because of physical needs, and so they can't get out and about. They don't drive. They depend on us to be their arms and legs. And so this CNA was hearing that this resident wanted a hoagie. But you can't just say, hey, give them a hoagie. That You have to look at their dietary restrictions. Can they you know, eat a hoagie roll, those kind of things. So she was speaking with the dining services employee, and they were trying to figure it out. And the dining service worker would say, well, but a hoagie roll. And, and the CNA said, well, what about a hot dog roll? That's softer. It's easier to chew. And say so that they were back and forth trying to figure this out. And uh, so I, I left. They, they were clearly making it happen and could figure it out. And the next day, that CNA came up to me, and she was so proud of herself. She said, we got so-and-so uh, his hoagie. And he said, it was the best hoagie ever. Now, I will pretty much guarantee that if any of us here had seen that, what they put together, we would not have used that as a descriptor as best hoagie ever. But for him it was, and I think it was more than just the hoagie. It was that staff member taking the time to be compassionate, to hear what he wanted, and to go out of her way to meet his needs. And that to me, it's a story of get to yes, which is another story for another day probably, but it's also showing compassion to those that we serve. You, you choke me up a little bit when you tell that story, and, and I'm okay with that. Um, actually, that does kind of lead into our next, that, that getting the yes piece does kind of lead a little bit into it. And I don't know if that's what you were thinking, but these emotional connections are important in society. Uh, and one of the main things, themes that I've seen at Living Branches is you, you really figure out how to get to yes. Um, no is seldom an answer. Uh, and this is, I think, a defining uh, idea, particularly for nonprofits these days. But nonprofits always have to be run like a business to remain viable. So how does this idea of yes play into the longevity of a successful nonprofit like Living Branches? Yeah, and we have a, a, a training. It's not really a program because it's forever. <laughs> Um, so I don't like to call it a program, but it's, it's our Living Branches experience and training in customer service and how, what is the experience we want our, our residents to have and what's the experience of for our staff. And we use the first word of our mission, which is TOGETHER, and we created an acronym, and the G of TOGETHER stands for GET TO YES. And when we talk about that, and that story I just told was an example of a, a GET TO yes, YES story, it's really easy to get to know. And depending who you talk to, I'm sure there would be staff and, and residents who would say, well, you guys really get to know pretty often, particularly this last year. <laughs> but G stands for get to yes. And the idea is no is the easy answer, right? You just say no. And that's the end of the conversation with your kids. No. Why? Because I said so. No. Yes requires creativity. It, creates, it, it requires thought. You know, when they got to yes for the hoagie, they had to think through the dietary restrictions. They had to think through all the implications. It took creative thought, but I think that's what can energize people too. And so it doesn't mean necessarily the big things. In fact, it's the small things that makes a difference. When, I, when we used to have funeral services and I go through the lines, it wasn't the big stories I was told. It was the little stories that were so meaningful to families. Uh, so the, the resident who wanted to ride a motorcycle, now I don't know what her age was, but let's say she was 95 and wanted to drive down 95 at 95 miles an hour. That was too risky, okay? So we didn't go for that, but we said, and it was our risk manager actually who had a, a tricycle motorcycle and 
drove her around the parking lot. So she got her wish to ride a motorcycle, um, um, and that was something to get to yes and do it in a safe way, but something that met her needs. But it didn't take a lot of time or energy or money, but it required creative thinking. It, created, it, it required time, and that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. I'm in an awkward position here. Let me move forward. I want to talk to Frank here real quick. So I've, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Frank Gallagher. I think most of you know uh, Dr. Frank. He is the superintendent of the Southern Area School Districts. Um, and I asked him to think about vulnerability this year. So that is a strength and not a weakness. Uh, it speaks to trust. It's about being real and showing your human side. And as the superintendent of Southern School District, you lead a large number of people. You lead professionals, you lead students, you lead families. That's no small task. You have multiple messages to communicate to various groups. School, school teachers, students, families have had a tough time this year. Uh, and they've all had different needs. And Frank, you have led through difficult times and you've led exceptionally well. Uh, and can you tell us some of the obstacles that you encountered this year and how an, you and your team were able to overcome those obstacles? Thank you, Steve. Um, and Ed, Steve's looking for a discount for his father. That's what he was really asking. Um, first of all, I'm so proud to be part of this group today, Steve. Thanks for including me. This has been tremendous. Um, and it's good to see people in, in person and not on a screen. Um, this year, certainly, like all my colleagues up here, uh, has been quite a year. And when I think, when Steve asked me to talk about vulnerability, I connect that with resiliency and perseverance. And when Tracy talked about the growth mindset, that's a mantra that we have in our organization. Um, and what she said is so true about uh, we're so, so many of us are stuck in that, that other mindset and not in the growth mindset. But when I think of vulnerability as a superintendent of schools for Satterton, this is my eighth year, um, I think of three moments uh, where I felt most vulnerable. The first was in 2013 when the largest mass murder in Montgomery County occurred in our district. I was driving to work, I got a call, and I thought, whoa, I have 6,500 students and 1,200 staff members in, across nine buildings, 49 square miles, and this guy's on the loose. But we got through that, and we came out stronger on the other side. Unfortunately, we lost a student and her parents but our, our community came together, and people like uh, Chief Leary were, were one of those leaders that made that happen. Second vulnerable moment was September, Labor Day weekend 2019. I was called by uh, one of my high-level executive team members that we were uh, under a cyber attack. Um, we got through that. The vulnerability piece quickly meant, led to resiliency and perseverance. And we got, were stronger on the other side, which actually prepared us, I believe, for March of 2020. March of 2020, I was called down to the Montgomery County IU in Norristown to an emergency superintendent's meeting. And prior to this, my executive team, my cabinet team, we were starting to talk about the potential of closing, just because what we were seeing in Europe and in Asia and knowing that it was now on the West Coast pretty strong in the state of Washington, and then the CHOP doctor situation down in King of Prussia, we knew something might possibly be coming, so we started to think and think differently. And with that, um, I went down to the IU, and we were, Montgomery County was the first group of schools that were told you had to shut down for two weeks. And um, I laugh at that because I thought, okay, two weeks, we, we can do this. Um, you know, we shut down for Hurricane Sandy for a week. We shut down for uh, Superstorm, whatever, Blizzard for a week. We could make this happen. Um, so that day, we were told, tomorrow, you have to shut down. Uh, that was a Friday. Fortunately, we had a teacher in service that day. We were allowed to have our teachers come in and get ready to work from home the next two weeks. I drove home, or drove back to the office that afternoon quickly assembled my team, and that feeling of vulnerability um, lasted for a long time because every milestone was a new sense of vulnerability. Um, the first two weeks, we, we handled that. 
it was uh, light, very light learning. Um, but then we were told another two weeks, and then we were told another month. And at this point, the superintendent started to get frustrated and said, let's just say the year, because if we can't keep plan, you can't plan by two, two weeks uh, when you're trying to educate children. And at the same time, with the switch of a light switch, we went from an organization that was fully in daily to one that was completely virtual, including offices. Um, we, quick, we are a Microsoft Teams organization, so we were pre prepared for that, but our students were not. So we had to virtually teach our students how to, to attend school through Microsoft Teams. And at the same time, all the tech companies were trying to catch up to what everyone needed, not just schools, but with uh, corporations and other organizations. So summer came, we got through it. We thought, okay, we're gonna, we could do this. We learned a lot. And the summer, I was determined all summer to make sure we could open our doors in September to every child who wanted to come back and then offer an online academy for an alternative. Because there are children who are compromised there are parents that are compromised, and there were legitimate reasons for wanting your child to be on our online academy. So all summer, my teams designed this online academy while other teams were figuring out how do we open school safely. So those partitions that you're sitting in between, we have them everywhere. Um, every elementary desk has a partition on it. Um, masks, this turned out to be the biggest controversial subject all summer because the mask mandate was not well received by some people. So we had to explain why these are so important. Um, we got over that. And by the way, children are the best mask wearers. They are absolutely the best mask wearers. They never complain. They got off the bus the first day of school. They all had their masks on. Um, but I had, we had several public meetings through Zoom where we did our, present, our safety presentations, our health and safety plan. We had to do an athletic health and safety plan because we knew that athletics was really important for the mental health of students. Um, we hired uh, about 30, 30 teachers to offer the online academy and the in-school, traditional school. Um, where we were spending lots of money. We were receiving money through the federal government and through other avenues, but we did have to dip into our fund balance. We are, have recovered from that. Um, luckily, our local economy is very strong, so we uh, did not experience the hit on property taxes and earned income taxes we thought we would. Um, but I knew I had to offer in school for students because many of our students work in the healthcare industry, or many of our parents work in the healthcare industry, in the meatpacking industry, and they needed their children to be in school, and children need to be in school. So, with that, we opened up the day after Labor Day. And we've been open ever since. We're the only school in Montgomery County that has been able to accomplish that. I'm proud of that. We've had some cases, but there's no evidence of school spread. So that vulnerable feeling a year ago in March um, has really allowed me to grow as a leader um, and, be, and persevere through this. Thanks, Frank. So as a resident of Southern Area School District, I want you to know that I was proud to say that my schools were open and educating students from almost day one of the new school year. There were a lot of unknowns, uh, but we did know this could be done safely, and according to the research, it was be as, you, as you relate, it was best for students to be in school. You and the rest of the district were clearly caring for our students and families, and you were able to do something extraordinary during a time of uncertainty. Can you tell us a little bit more about how this process unfolded with your team and what lessons you're able to take going forward? Well, I think I hit on some of that in my previous answer, but... Um, but I wanted to get the question in. Yeah, I, no, I appreciate it. I, I can talk, you know me, I can talk all day. Um, what we learned is how important it is as leaders to build um, functional teams. And I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of my team, um, both my executive team and my management team or my principals and our teacher teams have been incredible. So I think it was that culture of um, teamwork and that culture of collaboration that has really helped us get through this year. There's, there's been disagreements. Um, there's been lots of courageous conversations this year. But at the end of each day, our buses are, over 100 buses are rolling and 
one thing I did learn is my decision to recommend to open school was f first and foremost for children and where they should be learning is in school. Where their men mental health needs will be taken care of is in school and with our partners at Penn Foundation and, and other places. Um, but I also had on my back the decision to that if we went all virtual, hundreds of people would have been furloughed because you don't need bus drivers. You don't need as many food service workers. Um, and that was, a, that was also part of my decision making. And I knew that if we could build a safe way to open school during a pandemic, that it was the right choice for the community and the right decision for the community. And here we are a year later and doing, doing fairly well. In fact, we're having an in-person graduation um, and we are having a prom that was announced during this meeting, so I could say that now. Wonderful news. So. Well, you know, it's interesting. I've heard a couple different references to the teamwork piece uh, and the importance of putting those teams together, the diversity of opinion on those, and how you move forward. So uh, you just reiterated that. So thank you for, thank you for, that was a kind of an aha moment for me. So, uh, you know, one of the major takeaways that we've had this year is trust. Um, and there's always been a level of trust that we see in schools caring for our children. Uh, but this year really brought that piece to a visible level. And, and trust is created in a transparent system, uh, especially at Souderton. And, uh, th this year, and it flows from the top down. Uh, as, and, as each, and Frank, I'm wondering if you can say to each person here, uh, as, they, as we all build our brands, our, as we kind of work on ourselves, um, how can we include transparency uh, in what and, and advise people how we can provide that and embrace that as we build ourselves up and, and kind of work on our own stuff? I think transparency is the number one thing a, a leader needs to make sure happens in, in his or her organization. I'll give you an example. During the pandemic, particularly when we opened school this in September, we had people weren't really trusting us that we didn't have cases or we only had a few cases. So we ended up building a, um, a pandemic part of our website where we have a dashboard where it's updated on a regular basis of, of EMC has this many cases, high school has this many cases, and then it, it's a pretty complicated dashboard. Um, so that, I think, helped garner more trust from the community and from our staff because there are, we're, we had many staff members who were nervous Rightfully so. Um, if you go home at every night and you watch the news and it's the re repetitive news story, um, you're, and you, you need to filter some of that sometimes. And um, so I do believe trust is critical in an organization. And I, I connect that, I analogize that to uh, the auto industry. Uh, if you think back, I'm a car guy, so I, I, picked that, I picked that industry. When you go back to the Ford Pinto and the... They, they weren't, Ford wasn't really um, upfront about the dangerous gas tank explosions of the Ford Pinto. You think about the Ford Explorer in the late 80s, I'm picking on Ford, um, eight, late 80s and 90s with the tire uh, issue, and now we all have those sensors on our cars that says our tire pressure is too low when it goes below 30. So um, that's what I think about when I analogize that to, to industry and corporation. Thank you, Frank. It, it has been uh, wonderful to have uh, Souderton open, and and you know it was one. It is one less thing for parents to worry about, and that that ecosystem that we live in is really important because, as you as you mentioned, it could. Ed, Ed was talking about that virtuous cycle of, of building up. You know, you start laying off people. There's a virtuous cycle or an unvirtuous cycle going down. So thank you for the good work that you've done there. And my last speaker, Susie Berry. Susie is the owner of Travel House. Um, so Susie's question is really about hope. So many people may not know this about you, but you uh, were born and lived in Lebanon until the 19, early 1990s. Uh, I met you soon after you moved here. Uh, Living in Lebanon was probably an experience that I don't think many North Americans can identify with. 
Can you tell us a little bit about what your experience was like living in Lebanon, growing up there, and then ultimately moving to the United States and becoming the owner of Travel House, and what that process has taught you about hope? That's a big question. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you again, Steve, for inviting me uh, to be among uh, these panelists. They're beautiful, what they said, and... Uh, taught us a couple of things today. Um, when Steve called me and he said he's doing this um, event called Resilience and I thought of you as uh, giving you the word of hope, um, I was so happy actually. I was like, yes, hope, that's who I am. Um, so I am uh, Susie Berry, owner of Travel House and uh, I was born and raised in Beirut, Lebanon. I, wa I lived through the uh, Civil War. Um, I remember when it started, I was seven years old. I remember my mom coming to our uh, school. I was in second grade, pulling, out, pulling us out of school uh, because um, the shooting started in our area. So that's the first, um, um, you know, remembering uh, during my childhood. So we did not have a good uh, life in Lebanon. Uh, I did not have a good childhood, but um, I'm very hopeful. And this is who I am today. Um, my parents did not come from a rich family, did not come from educated family. Um, I'm one of three children, I'm the oldest. Uh, my brother lives here, and my sister still lives in Lebanon with her family. Uh, for 20 years in Lebanon, um, we went through uh, different towns. We were refugees going from one town to town. We were trying to escape the bombs, the shellings, uh, the hunger. Um, our parents tried their best. We, were live, we lived in the east part of Beirut uh, during the 1975 and 1976. In a way, they split Beirut or Lebanon to be east and west. So we lived in the east in the beginning where all the Christians lived. And that's where we had the hardest time. And not because we're not, we're not Christians, we are. It's just because my dad, on his passport, he had uh, that he was born in Haifa. And the war was between the Christian militias and the Palestinians. So to them, was born in Haifa, that means you're from Palestine. I remember um, a militia group came to our house, uh, kicking our dad, rolling him down the floor, and listening to my mom, hearing her say, where do you think your Jesus was born? He was born in Israel, in Palestine. And because he was just born in Haifa, you're doing this. We are Christians too. We didn't feel that we are in peace until really we moved to the West Beirut, to the capital. That's where all the religions were, between Muslims, Druze, Christians. That's where our life started in a better place. Um, during my childhood, uh, yes, we, we uh, did not go to school every single day. We had strikes all the time. I don't think I finished third grade at all because every time we go to school, the first two weeks, then we go home and then we move to another town. So I don't think I went through third grade at all. Um, we went to school, I graduated from there. Um, I started to work in Beirut, Lebanon. And then at 20 years old, um, I told my parents I wanted to move to Jordan. And of course, um, my mom did not want me to leave at all. In our culture, women do not leave their household until they're married. So that was a big thing uh, to my family that I'm, I wanna just go ahead and move to Jordan because I was thinking I'm gonna have a better life in Jordan. So I did, 
We went to Jordan, me and my brother, to start a new life. Of course, he did not like Jordan at all, and he went back to Lebanon. And here I was stuck there for three and a half years. It was a good move for me, though. This is where I um, learned the travel business. I worked in a travel agency there, one of the biggest travel agency in that country. I worked also at the Jordanian airport, and um, that's how my travel business started. Something a lot of us cannot, uh, we just can't relate to it. Um, you know, and there, there is this, there is this, there is a difference between hope and optimism. So optimism is an unrealistic thought that things will get better. Hope is trusting and working at things getting better. Uh, so the travel and leisure industry was hit really hard these last 12 months. Uh, can you share with us some of the challenges and opportunities that you see as we move back into a time that will be able, you'll be able to do your work again. Uh, it'll be more conducive to travel uh, and, and kind of the robust industry that we enjoyed 13 months ago. I have to bat, but I will. So um, when I lived in- I wasn't sure if you wanted to, that's uh, why. No, I, I think it's part of my life. Um, so at, uh, my brother uh, had the chance to come to the United States through MCC program. It's a Mennonite um, uh, program to bring, um, not students, but people from different countries and be here for a year to live with family. So he was one of the MCC program students. And um, my parents were like thinking, oh my gosh, one daughter is in Jordan, our son is in America. Uh, like, you know, we need to, for you to be together, both of you. So anyway, I said, okay, I'll try it. I got a visa and came to United States. Well, I have to say, I really, really was depressed. I hated it. It was like really hard for me. Uh, I mean, I was 23 or 24 years old, moving to another country again, uh, leaving uh, your friends, your work, uh, where you lived all your life, and here to start a whole new life. I um, started to go to Blooming Glen Mennonite Church, and this is where Steve goes, and that's, I think, where we met uh, first. And, um, but I needed to work, and I did not have my work permit. So for the first year I was in the United States, all I did was babysitting or cooking for people and uh, waiting for my work permit. And I got my work permit after one year, and I was um, hired uh, at Travel House in 1993. I worked for Travel House as a travel agent for 12 years, and then when the owner decided to sell it, um, I wanted to buy it. Uh, it was time for me uh, to uh, grow, and I needed a change. So in 2005, May 2005, I bought Travel House, and uh, we grew. Uh, when I bought the business, it was in the minus, and we brought it up to a great, uh, successful business. 2020 was supposed to be our biggest year, biggest, biggest year. I had 10 people working in my office. I had six outside agents. Um, we were busy. Uh, the week that we shut down, I was supposed to take a group of 25 people to Egypt, Jordan, and Lebanon. That was the first time that I put a tour to go to Lebanon. And here in five days, I had to say to the group, we can't go. We had a group to Spain in April, we had to cancel. We had a group to Athens for the women's group, 50 women, we had to cancel. It was supposed to be our year and uh, we couldn't. The travel business, I think people, uh, when, when everything would start to shut down, probably th people thought more about the restaurants and uh, you know, they're closed and all that stuff, but the travel business, it's affecting so many people. It starts with a travel agent, uh, a tour company, a hotel, airplane, uh, museums, restaurants, uh, 
a lot of different venues that uh, are linked together. So, and yes, we thought two weeks and we will be back. My first post on Facebook after they said two weeks, uh, my post said, I survived a civil war in Lebanon. I survived 9-11. We all survived 9-11 here. And we're going to survive the pandemic. And I thought, really, it's going to be like a month or two. And here, a year later, um, we're still going through it. But I do have hope. All my videos, monthly videos on our website, it's all about hope. And uh, we're, we're seeing that two weeks ago, the business started to pick up. And uh, we're looking forward to travel again. Anything else you want to share? You got it. Yes. <laughs> well, I, she's a good friend of mine, so I can tease her like that. Well, I want to thank our speakers. Um, I, I knew it was going to be good. I wasn't sure it was going to be this good. This is, was fantastic. Can we give everyone a, a round of applause? <laughs> so I want to thank them for sharing their thoughts today. You know, I, I trust that each one of you in the audience uh, and watching online uh, was able to find a, a, a few nuggets uh, of wisdom to take with you as encouragement uh, over the next several weeks and months. And while each of us have had unique experiences, we heard those unique experiences here, and we've dealt with them in different ways, uh, we've all endured a common experience, right? Uh, we've learned we've we've had we've learned and we've had to grow we've experienced pain uh, we've learned to do things in a different way all in a really short period of time and at the very least it's been exhausting it, but it's also been an opportunity to learn new ways to do business new ways to interact with colleagues and lead groups and while it's certainly been an unsettling time it's also full of opportunity and it allows each of us to step back, examine where we're at, but also to lead and create a better community. And we do this by meeting with one another. We do this by listening with each other and hearing stories and learning from one another. So I want, again, I want to thank our panelists. I especially want to thank Allmac as our presenting sponsor. Uh, and I want to thank each one of you uh, for being here today uh, as we work at creating the community that we want in the greater Indian Valley region. And I want to encourage us to keep moving forward. I look forward to seeing you all soon. Have a great afternoon. Bye.